and tomorrow in the neuromuscular world. Um, it is so um, nice to be able to, when we see our patients, tell them that we do have options for them today um, that are on the market as well as many, many trial options for them. There are three approved drugs. We call them the R-cubed, uh, Rilazol, Radicava, and Relivrio. Um, they are approved in the United States and, and Canada, um, but only Rilazol is approved in Europe. We have um, another drug under FDA review, that's a Trifersin, um, and that's an antisense oligo against SOD1. Um, we have centers all over the world that uh, provide multidisciplinary care for people with ALS, and we know that improves their quality of life um, and their longevity. We have an amazing um, advocacy patient population that's working hand in hand with clinicians and scientists to try to push the envelope on getting drugs uh, approved faster, uh, about um, getting more funding support from the NIH and other federal organizations. Um, and it's really never been uh, as good as it is now of, of really a community uh, in sync with the same purpose and the same vision, and it's really making a difference. With that, we have amazing uh, foundations, uh, including the MDA, really as a leader in how do we get the foundations uh, caring about the same illness, working together, and funding uh, larger projects together to move the needle uh, much faster. So it is an incredible, incredible time. Um, and so with that comes uh, really innovations in the in, um, how do we do trials, how do we test things faster, and how do we really hear the patient voice about how it works for them to be part of our clinical trials. So uh, in 1995, um, shortly after the first gene was discovered, a group of us in the Northeast, uh, really under leadership of Ted Monsat uh, back there and Dr. Brown and, and Dr. Schefter, got together to think, okay, now that we know one cause of the illness and we are starting to get some animal models, how do we actually do trials in this field? At that point, we didn't really have a lot of outcome measures, we didn't have trial sites, and so we used to meet, um, you know, monthly, uh, about nine centers in New England. Um, and I, the work that was started then uh, really has, I think, led to um, ALS really being a field that is so primed for therapeutic advances, because now, this Northeast ALS Consortium um, is no longer Northeast. It's really a global uh, ALS uh, clinical research consortium. It has more than 147 sites, all, uh, mainly in the North America, but also in Europe and in Asia, more than 800 members. And everyone is part of this consortium, meaning if you're a scientist at that institution or a physical therapist or a nurse or a doctor, you are part of this network. And this group is all about collaborating um, being generous, being resilient, uh, because we certainly had our trial failures, and being very persistent about making an impact on this illness. Um, so we have over 30 years now uh, of uh, running clinical trials in ALS. Uh, we have centers all over, and the idea there was that no patient with ALS should have to travel very far to be part of a research study. Uh, we've run over 79 uh, trials with different companies as well as academic-led. Uh, uh, 50 of those have been uh, interventional trials. And so in this um, really enormous amount of uh, research, um, New Dexta has uh, come out of Neil's related work, which is a treatment for pseudobulbar affect in people with ALS. Also a study led by Richard Smith that New Dexta helps speech and swallowing function in people with ALS. A study of mixilatine for cramps led by Dr. White and then the recent Relivrio uh, FDA approval uh, was run through Niels and the Trifersin study as well. Um, so in those 50 trials, a lot of them didn't work, and that isn't unusual And when you start in a field. Um, but as the science gets better, the chance of success is also going, uh, going much higher. But we decided from the beginning that we were going to learn from every clinical trial, and that was one of the things I learned as a fellow, that you, have, you should really design your study so that no matter what the answer is, you've learned something about the illness. Um, so with Melanie Leitner from Prize for Life and Alex Sherman, um, and uh, many foundations, uh, there was a big push to gather the data from every completed clinical trial, if not the entire data set, at least the data from the placebo participants, and merge that together as an open source database. And this was done before kind of the big uh, push that we have now about open access and data sharing. And this is called PROACT, and there's now over uh, data from over 28,000 people who participated in trials, and many papers have come out of this uh, data set, uh, predictive algorithms, ways to do trials better.
And uh, now new companies that are doing trials who have benefited from using PROACT are contributing their data, with the, the latest ones being uh, the Relivio company, the Amelix. Also, um, with all the studies, we now do genetic testing, we collect samples, and those are samples uh, in a biorepository held by NEILs uh, that are shared with any investigator, all, whether academic or pharma in the world who's, who is studying ALS. And those samples are what kind of helps us develop these biomarkers, such as neurofilament, which is turning out to be such an important one for the upcoming ADCOM for Tafersen. A couple of years ago, we also wanted to again think about how can we speed things up because we, we really heard the patient voice about the urgency for this illness and we see it every day in our clinic. So we set up a single IRB process for our, our network so that instead of a new trial taking maybe 9 to 12 months for every site to have their ethics board approve a study, that can now be done in less than 30 days. The other key thing that Niels has done and continues to do is to train people uh, on ALS research, to train site investigators, train young people to lead clinical trials and design trials, outcome measure, and, and train people and their families living with the illness to be research ambassadors. And now we have actually over 500 research ambassadors who serve on steering committees, advisory committees for companies, and really give the patient voice to how we should be setting up our clinical trials. So I wanted to talk about um, three uh, uh, trial initiatives. Um, the um, Amelix Relivio story, a little bit about the Tropherson, um, and then the end with uh, what we're doing with the Healy platform trial. Um, so a couple of years ago, we met, we were really fortunate, met um, the two CEO and founders of Amelix, um, Justin and Josh, who are here in the audience. Um, and they had an idea for both Alzheimer's and ALS about combining two um, drugs that target different parts of the biology. One, Terso, that um, targets mitochondrial dysfunction, and another, um, sodium thiobutrate that targets um, ER stress. And that perhaps together they would be better than uh, separate. And they uh, approached one of our scientists, Rudy Tanzi, who's an Alzheimer's doctor, and together they worked out the science. And they were right that in the lab these two drugs are synergistic. Um, and so they came to Niels about how they could do a first trial in ALS. And since these drugs already uh, were um, used for other indications, we could go rapidly to a phase two study. And that's where Dr. Paganoni, who's a phenomenal uh, physiatrist, uh, clinician, and researcher, came in to help them design and lead the study through the Northeast ALS Consortium. And I'll just highlight um, the, the top line results that this combination of drugs slowed progression um, almost 30% um, in our six-month study and also had a survival benefit for our patients with a very good survival uh, safety uh, profile. And this led to really a remarkable um, uh, um, event uh, with, uh, the, again, the community coming together with the regulatory agencies um, and the whole entire field for an approval of Relivrio last uh, September. Uh, and so this is now uh, approved for our patients. It's something we can prescribe. Um, there is um, a, a subsequent study on, uh, going on right now called Phoenix, which is a, a larger uh, phase three trial, uh, post-marketing uh, trial uh, for the U.S. And uh, those results are expected you know, later, last, later in the year or early 2024. Um, however, um, this was really a fundamental um, shift, um, I, we think really, from the FDA of approving a drug on a single study uh, for a serious illness like ALS. And um, uh, Billy Dunn, who led that from the FDA, is not at the FDA anymore, but he really talked about uh, the importance of regulatory flexibility in an illness like ALS. And so this is, this is really an exciting path forward for our field. Um, the other exciting thing in the field is really uh, where we are on gene therapies for the, for the genetic forms of the illness. And Susan was one of my, uh, the first, actually she was the, the first person I ever took care of with ALS. And she had the A4V SOD1 uh, illness, which is the, the most rapid form of ALS that we see with people typically living nine months, uh, maybe to a year. Um, and I learned a lot from her about how to be a doctor, how to do clinical research. And as you heard, we were doing kind of the opposite experiment in the mid-90s where we were giving people intrathecal SOD1. Um, but that was really before we understood that the mutation really causes a toxic gain of function and the uh, right therapeutic approach is to lower um, the uh, SOD1 protein. So um, uh, 
the, uh, my commitment to her uh, before she passed away was that we would not give up. We would keep being resilient uh, on this illness until we found a treatment. So it was a huge uh, pleasure to call her husband and her son, oh, son's now over 30 uh, years old, to share with them the results of the Terfersen um, uh, trial and that we have finally come to the point where this is going to be a treatable form of the illness. Um, but this didn't come in a straight course. Uh, so in 2010-2011, uh, Tim Miller, who had done a lot of the work with Richard Smith and Don Cleveland in the lab to develop ASO for SOD1, they uh, came forward with a trial uh, for um, people with uh, SOD1 ALS, and they approached me and Niels about, could we help them design that trial? And again, that's the beauty of these um, you know, trial networks, is that they can engage with the scientists when they have a great idea and help them bring it to patients. So back then, it was really the support of the MDA and the ALS Association that let us do that first trial. We were working with um, Ionis Pharmaceuticals, uh, back then known as Isis Pharmaceuticals, and they provided the the um, ASO and some funds, but most of the funding was from the foundations. And we went to the FDA to get permission. I still remember that meeting where they uh, really told us uh, that we had to uh, not be that aggressive and that um, we didn't know a lot about ASOs and, uh, and their pharmacokinetics and to really dose very low. So those, that initial study was with a different ASO than, than to first, and it was the first generation really. And while we didn't see any safety issues in people, um, there were some issues in the, in the long-term tox that were more related to the, that particular backbone of the uh, oligonucleotide. So there was a reboot, a uh, desire to make a, a better uh, version of that, um, and that took about four years. And fast forward to the, the phase one to three trial that um, Tim Miller led um, that was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine that, that is leading to the review uh, this week by an ADCOM for hopefully accelerated approval for Traversin uh, for people with ALS. Now, I know we're going to have talks tomorrow on gene therapy, so I just, I'm not going to show the data here, but I'll just highlight that this is a treatment that lowered SOD1 as expected. It lowered neurofilament by about 50% at 12 weeks, and that um, we started to see clinical effects around six months that kept getting better and better uh, the longer people were treated. And it is really, for me, one of the first um, times I've seen people in a trial um, not everybody, but uh, a, a large number stop progressing and some people even get some return of function, which tells us that it's possible in, our, in this illness, that if we get upstream and we get understand the biology of the illness and can target the, the upstream cause, then, then maybe really we can stop this illness. And that gives uh, people with all forms of ALS a lot of hope. So um, Dr. Appel mentioned the Healy ALS platform trial, and this was an idea that we really got um, from reading an article by uh, Janet Whitcock in the New England Journal of Medicine about master uh, protocols and platform trials and encouraging people in all fields to think about this if you have a large number of therapies under development, because it's a way to really accelerate getting answers, lowering the number of people you need on placebo, and really cutting the costs and time to development. And as I read that, I met really an amazing uh, person, Sean Healy, a patient of mine with ALS, who wanted to make a difference for others. And so he asked us to propose what could accelerate treatment, and we proposed this platform trial. So the idea is in the traditional trial, you test one drug at a time, you, you build all your infrastructure, you find your sites, you contract, you do the trial, and then when it's over, you take the whole thing down and you start all over again. And that's, that's okay if you have one or two things that you're developing, but once you have a big pipeline for a treatment, it's, it's terribly inefficient. And so the platform trial approach has been very successful in oncology and, and other, other fields. It's where you have, you test multiple drugs in the same platform, you share the infrastructure, you share the placebo. Each person in the study gets a one, one treatment. Um, and then you can, again, cut the time about in half of getting effective treatments. So we started to, to pull this together in 2018, 2019, and we got input from all the stakeholders, from the patients to the industry partners, the site investigators, and Niels and the FDA. Um, and we actually went to the FDA. This is a picture of us with our, the three first companies we worked with, all going to the FDA for a common meeting together. Um, and this is really an approach that is a, what I call win-win for everybody involved. 
Um, the idea is you have a master protocol um, and this shared infrastructure. And that master protocol dictates the visit schedule, the inclusion criteria, and, uh, and it's, it's, it is somewhat rigid so that you can share the placebo data across the, across the different drugs. Uh, so in 2020, uh, we started with the first three um, uh, uh, regimen and pharmaceutical partners. Uh, the next year, we added um, a fourth one. And you get huge efficiencies in adding a drug because it's basically an amendment to the protocol. So so it's a 30-day FDA review, about a 19-day or 17-day IRB review. And when you, again, have the central IRB, you're basically adding a new drug in about a month, um, as, as opposed to the more standard way where it could take about a year to get the study launched. And then we added uh, two more. Um, uh, and, sorry, one more in 2022, and, and we're adding two more in 2023. Um, so we're very excited about this. Again, with the goal of this platform trial is to get answers to the best treatments for people with ALS as fast as we can. So we started this in the middle of the pandemic, um, but um, almost all of our centers were able to go to their institutions and be able to keep doing ALS studies. And we've enrolled over 1,000 patients. Uh, we have an amazing patient advisory committee uh, that helped us both in design, but also in how do you attract people into the study, how do you keep them in there. And one of the advice they gave us early on was have a weekly webinar, half an hour, where you just give updates on the science and the trial. And so we do this every week. And this trial now has enrolled about three times faster than typical trials in, a in ALS. Uh, we started with 52 of our uh, 147 anneal sites, and we found that we quickly um, outstripped the capacity at the sites where the, the patient interest in being in the study was more than the, the sites could, could actually handle, so we added 22 more sites. And so just briefly, when someone comes in, they are randomized three to one to active drug versus placebo. We designed this as a phase two trial, so it's a 24-week treatment, and then people can have active treatment afterwards if they would like to. Uh, the main outcome measure is a functional rating scale that accounts also for uh, mortality, but um, fortunately in the six-month period, that um, uh, the majority of people uh, do survive that, that period, and we also add different biomarkers. So if someone comes into the study, they're randomized to one of the active treatments at that time. So there, there are three active arms, they go to one of the three, and they know and their doctor knows which one of those treatment regimens they're, they're assigned to. And then there's a second randomization within the treatment arm, uh, three to one active placebo, and, and then people don't know uh, what they were assigned to. And then people are followed for the six months and then uh, open label. And then when we analyze, let's say, regimen A, we take the data from all the people on that regimen and we compare them to the shared placebo data set. So you have that full uh, comparison group and uh, you know, robust power for the analysis. We have a great uh, trial design team that meets weekly and works with our partners to design their particular regimen, um, including really a great group of uh, statisticians from Barry Consultants and MGH. I think you'll hear from um, uh, Melanie, Leitner, uh, Melanie uh, Katana from Barry uh, tomorrow a little bit more about the statistics. We also try um, to grow the number of people leading multicenter trials in the ALS field. So for every drug regimen, we pair uh, a more senior experienced trialist with a junior new ALS trialist, um, uh, again, with the goal of getting many more people who know how to lead and design ALS clinical trials. And then no matter what the outcome of the drug is, while of course we want them to be positive on clinical efficacy, we also want to learn about the field. So we keep adding different fluid and digital biomarkers um, to, to the regimens, and those are then available resources for the community. Uh, it's, we are finding that the interest in platform trials in the neurotherapeutic space is huge, and, and so we, we've talked to lots of groups um, and trying to pay it forward because we learned from so many other groups about how to do platform trials, and I know this is an interest in many uh, neuromuscular diseases as well. So uh, we have the results from the first four of the regimens. Uh, so in, in two years, we got results of four drugs. Uh, the first uh, one was actually stopped early for futility. The second one was negative. And the third and fourth one have some positive phase two data that really are leading, are giving information uh, to pursue phase three trials. That's with um, the clean na uh, nanomedicine and prolenia. The fifth one is done with enrollment, and we expect results in the fall of 2023. And the sixth and seventh are just starting enrollment now. 
So with that, I just want to say that none of this is done in a silo. This is really a, a huge community um, that's working together to try to um, accelerate how we can help our patients with ALS. Uh, the platform trial is funded by philanthropy, some of the, the companies, but many, many of the foundations, including the Muscular Dystrophy Association. So again, thank you for this amazing award and for everything that the MDA has done to help me and so many other people with their careers in ALS and neuromuscular disease.